Welcome. Thank you for joining Snow Isle Libraries for Open Book with Garth Stein and Matt Southworth. Your mics are muted. Use chat to ask questions. We will use chat on our end to share links to any lists and book websites mentioned today. Look for them at the end of the program. The Cloven started as a short story Garth Stein wrote in 2010. He came back to it a few years later after an introduction to Everett-based illustrator Matt Southworth. They clicked and started to work to tell and illustrate Garth's story as a graphic novel trilogy. The Cloven follows the story of Tuck, a young adult who was subjected to a lifetime of peculiar medical experiments by a secretive scientist. Book one explores medical ethics, how some people get marginalized, homelessness, and societal suspicions of others. Garth Stein is a novelist and playwright, best known for the New York Times bestseller, The Art of Racing in the Rain. Matt Southworth's work as a comic, as a comic artist and writer includes Spider-Girl, Spider-Man, X-Men, and Thunderbolts for Marvel Comics, and IDW's X-Files. Garth and Matt named several books and authors who inspired them, and we have listed those and some of their own works that are in the Snow Isles collection. A link to this book list will be posted in chat at the end of the program. Are you planning to add The Cloven to your personal library? Support independent bookstores with your purchases. Find bookstores near you at bookshop.org. This event is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel with captions in a few days. Check our website often for additional opportunities to hear from authors, illustrators, and audiobook narrators. Now, let's meet Garth Stein and Matt Southworth. Welcome to Snow Isle Libraries. Hey, you thanks for having us. It. Yeah. So uh, you guys, you know, you're both, you, you are both known for doing uh, your own kind of thing and you sort of have come together to create uh, something new that might be a little bit different for both of you. Um, so let, we're going to talk about The Cloven, book one. That's your graphic novel that you've collaborated on. Um, and Garth, uh, we'll start with you. Um, your novels feature characters who often struggle to find answers when life throw th throws them curveballs, but The Cloven has its protagonist, Tuck, facing much deeper and darker themes. Biotech and medical ethics, dispossession, homelessness, income inequality, authoritarianism. Can you tell us how you got there and went there after The Art of Racing in the Rain introduced us to the philosophical Enzo? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um... Uh, it was part, of, I started writing this story as part of a literary series at Hugo House, which is a literary center here in Seattle. And uh, it was really, uh, their literary series are sort of famous for um, commissioning new works from writers, but then, you know, sort of saying, look, let your hair down on this one, you know, don't, don't think about, you know, everything, think about pleasing an audience and so I, I really did and knowing it was a northwest audience I wanted to work with material that was here in the northwest and uh, and I also but you know I wanted to have a lot of fun with it and I wanted to like get a lot of uh, dynamic uh, sort of interaction with the audience uh, but I also want I always want to leave people with something you know I don't I think that that art and uh, my in my case uh, writing and um, but there are uh, all sorts of disciplines. I think art is there to uh, engage with people and to provoke them and to make them think about something in a new way. And so I wanted to really engage on some of the problems that we're having, at least when I wrote this short story back in 2011 um, in Seattle. At that time, there were big concerns about the homeless situation, about income inequality. Um, and it was kind of the pre-emergent uh, you know, ability to alter DNA. So when I originally wrote the idea, it was before the whole CRISPR thing blew up, which was this new way of um, editing DNA um, that just happened in the past couple of years. And so, you know, trying to mess with that sort of uh, mess that we all are dealing with. And so uh, I, was, I was liberated by the medium in a sense. It was a short story gonna be read once in front of a live audience. And so I could have some freedom um, to let loose. And so I, I tried to let as loose as I could and the audience loved it. And that's when I said, I think more can be done with this. Uh, tried doing it as a novel. Mm -hmm. um, it did not work out for me, 
And, uh, and that's when um, I was introduced to Matt Southworth by um, our mutual friend, Eric Reynolds, who's associate publisher at Fantagraphics, the greatest graphic novel, comic book publisher in the world. And he said, you should talk to Matt. And Matt and I sort of got together. But the, the goal was always to do something that was uh, uh, provocative and um, thoughtful and, um, you know, really kept a keen eye open on sort of the traps that we find ourselves in right now right? Mm -hmm. Who do we listen to? Who's telling us the truth? Which direction are we going to go down? And, and, and how we cling to the decisions we make, right? Like, so yeah. we're going to make this one path. It better be the right one. And so therefore we entrench ourselves to defend it. And, and that turns out that's what happens a lot in the cloven. Mm -hmm. So that's, yeah. that's what got me in that direction. Yeah. So it, so how, you you wrote the you wrote the short story for the Cloven in two thousand ten, right? Oh uh, yeah, two thousand ten. Yeah. And and then, but it it, it sort of uh, lingered on the shelf for a while before you got a you and Matt got connected. So what were what were you doing in the meantime? And had the Cloven been sitting, you know, and were you trying to figure out a way to to tell the well, Cloven that's differently? That's a great question, and I'll say it wasn't ripe yet at the uh, for me at the time. Uh, I, the way I work is very much um, I am a I am a, a channeler. I am a conduit. I am a servitor to an idea that is out there. I hope that I feel something that is going on in the zeitgeist, and mm -hmm. I think that maybe I have an access patch that I can get into there and mm -hmm. find some stuff and bring it back out and show people what I found. And so it's not about me, it's about the work always. And so the initial ideas of the Cloven are much less formed than they are now that we've been working on it, Matt and I have been working on it together. But you know, the initial ideas were to provoke and to make people think, but then we started getting into it and we're starting to deal with some real ethical issues, um, some, some moral issues. Um, I mean, there's there's tons of stuff uh, that that create this depth of the yeah. story uh, that Matt and I could really dig into, both from a story point of view and 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 how and the visual aspect of how the the visuals tell that story also greatly yeah. influenced uh, influence how the, the the reader receives it. So, yeah, I, I think that. Um, um, you know, it's funny. I, we used to joke about my father-in-law, Grandpa Steve, Steve Prolbinder in New York. You know, he would buy a pair of khakis and then, you know, leave them sitting folded with the tag on it, you know, for three years on the chair in his bedroom and then finally take the tags off and wash them. And then he would start wearing them. And like, why didn't you start wearing them three years ago? And he's like, I don't know. I, I wasn't ready yet. And so I think that that we all have that sense of when we're ready for things. Mm -hmm. And I, I dare say the, the best thing we can do is listen to our senses, listen to our intuitions, because sometimes if we push something when we're not ready for it, it's going to be premature and it's not going to end up, uh, you know, delivering in the way that we were hoping it was going to deliver. Yeah. So what, what while, uh, while the Cloven was working its way through your creative process, what else were you working on at the same time? Oh, well, at the time I was writing my uh, my novel, which was a follow up to The Art of Racing in the Rain, yeah. uh, which was called A Sudden Light, uh, yeah. and that was published in 2014. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I had I had other things on my plate and, um, you know, uh, I'm a novelist. I mean, I write long form fiction. That's what I do. It's I don't write short stories. Um, I do dabble in playwriting sometimes. Um, but, you know, that's my thing is is novels. And so uh, that's what, you know puts, uh, you know, food on the table for my lovely children. So uh, in, a, in a sense, the idea of the Cloven was sort of a side project. When I tried to up it to be a full project, um, it, there, I met with some resistance in the sense that, you know, um, people don't necessarily love it that much when uh, a writer goes too, strays too far from uh, his or her trajectory that, you know, has been sort of announced. Yeah. And um, so as a novel, it was a trick, but as a graphic novel, I can do anything I want. Yeah. I mean, right. So because uh, <laughs> yeah. all I can do is say, yeah, but it's a graphic novel. Yeah. So. And, and that kind of brings up, that's kind of, kind of a follow up there is that as a great, you're not known for 
you're known for writing and work. Yeah, yeah. So you're, you know, scribbling, scribbling your stories out. And so yeah. a graphic novel is, you know, for, for me as a reader of your work, that was a yeah. really big leap. Yeah, I, I guess it can be, but you know what? It's okay, man. It's yeah. all right. We got a parachute for you. It's yeah. not going to hurt. It really isn't. And the bottom line is that most of us grew up reading comic books. I mean, oh, yeah. I grew up on Bad Magazine, way. right? Mm -hmm. You know, the Fantastic Four, you know, Spider-Man, yeah. that kind of stuff. That's, that's, you grow up on that. And um, in a weird way, that stays with you, that syntax. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then we ref we refine it. I remember the first book I read without pictures in it, and and how like I was like freaked out by this. It's yeah. Alice in Wonderland, by the way. Yeah. And I was like so impressed with myself for having done that. But that that is a that is a big leap um, in the way our our cognition works. So in a sense, we're just stepping back a bit. And yeah. and you know the 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 issue with adults going to a graphic novel format when they're not when they're not in that you know when that's not part of their thing is that you're going to read too fast you're going to you're not going to you're not going to look at the pictures you're just going to read the dialogue bubbles and that's a real problem because the trust me the artwork the pic the, the drawings convey vastly more information than the dialogue bubbles they really yeah. do yeah. So that's what's been so great about this process is sort of like at, at my old ripe age. You know, it's funny. Uh, I was at the grocery store today and the checkout person said, oh, I really like the color of your hair. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> there is no color in my hair. It took me 50, 56 years to get this color. So don't, you know, don't be making fun of me. But, you know, we, we're old. We're, we're kind of entrenched in our ways. And we, exactly. we sort of like push things aside. And, and you really can't because there's so much information and so much mood and tone and emotion being conveyed in the artwork that it's, uh, I find it a hugely liberating medium. Um, and I, I think that it conveys, if you delve in it, there's, it's just as uh, packed with um, stuff as a yeah. novel would be. Yeah. Well, Matt, let's talk about comics and kind of and kind of the storytelling that goes into the illustrations that you're doing on uh, on Garth's story and plots. How do you, how do you how do you interpret uh, sort of two parts? How do you interpret what Garth's writing in in an illustrated form, and how do you collaborate on making sure that you know you're both you both end up on the same page? Uh, well, this is the most collaborative comic project I've ever worked on. Um, in a lot of cases, especially if you're doing sort of monthly comic books, um, you know, if you're doing something like, like you mentioned that X-Files thing. That yeah. I, did. I forgot I even did it. <laughs> uh, like literally when you said it, I was like, I never did the X. Oh yeah, I did it. Uh, you know, like in a situation like that, you get a script and now it's your problem and get it done on time and don't bother anybody. Yeah. That's usually the way monthly comics are done. It's much more of kind of a factory setup, which I, I don't necessarily mean in a pejorative way, but it, it is much more about, um, you know, making a product. Um, this has been a lot different. It's been much more collaborative for many reasons. The chief being that Garth is very open to, to collaboration and, um, and is excited by collaboration. That it, it wasn't just a thing of like, you know, his not feeling threatened, but his actually actively getting excited about it and like, oh, okay, well, yeah, let's, Let's do that. And so, uh, so I guess I'm answering the second part of the question first. Now to the first part of the question, second. Um, initially, he gave me, for the first volume of the Cloven, a, I can't remember if it was the full script. I believe it was the full script. Um, and then as we talked about it, he had written basically as though it was like a screenplay, sort of in a semi-screenplay format, not as a screenplay, but it's sort of read like a screenplay. Um, a lot of times comic scripts will be very, very uh, minutely detailed and they'll say page 17, uh, 
Panel one, Steven walks in the room and throws his keys on the counter. Panel two, Steven opens the refrigerator door and takes a beer. Panel three, the phone rings, you know, and it's it's all broken down like that. Garth yeah. didn't write it like that. Garth wrote it like Stephen walks in the room and throws his keys on the counter. He gets a beer and the phone rings. Yeah. So then it was it was up to me, and then uh, it was up to me to sort of break it down. Like, how many panels is this? How many pages is this scene? How how uh, how are we pacing this? So in some ways. I have a I have a background in theater and film as well. In some ways, this was more like a directing job mm -hmm. than a typical comics job, which frankly is exactly what I was looking for. Oh, that's cool. I didn't know that exactly, yeah. but it it was the feeling of being able to go to expand and contract and to emphasize and to place focus and. And frankly, a lot of things that, that a lot of comics writers don't even think about, like point of view. Mm -hmm. Who's actually, you know, wielding the camera in this yeah. scene? Um, those things were, were much more open. And so I would say, you know, uh, the scene where Steven comes in the kitchen and gets the beer, what if we told it from the point of view of the beer? And he'd be like, that's a great idea. Let's do it. And uh, so he was very open to changing things and very open to expanding or contracting or cutting or revising or whatever. Not that I was um, demanding any of that. It's just, we were able to talk uh, because this is another thing that was very unusual is that we were actually meeting face to face right. in his office in Georgetown or at my house in Everett. Um, and we have a very um, discursive uh, way of working where we wind up talking about movies and we talk about a trip that we took to some place and something that a girlfriend said to us 20 years ago. And then eventually we sort of, that all starts to kind of bubble into the soup and stew of the book. Yeah. Yeah. Any, any, any girlfriend reference I made about 20 years ago is not true. Um, 28 <laughs> years is the limit. And my wife will attest to that 1993 we got married. Yeah, yeah. Good to know. 29 year old girl. Uh, yeah. Old. Yeah. We got to go back farther than. That. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but it, no, but it is true. I, I think that what's fascinating is that, that, um, it really is very much a, a, if you were to make the analogy to film like that, it really, it really was like, as if I'm like kind of the producer, writer, a screenwriter. Yeah. And I'm like, I need a collaborator director to, to make it come to life in the way that I don't know how to do because I write books, you know, right. and, and you know, the syntax, Matt, and you know how to, and you see the redundancies that on one page, we're gonna have this and two pages later, we're gonna have the same thing. You're right, we should right. cut that scene. I mean, in a weird way, you could be an awesome novel editor by like seeing the way the story plays out and identifying it to writers so they can see where they've kind of indulged in repetition and you know that sort of thing. Yeah, so that probably is easier and pays better than being a comic artist, right? <laughs> so the work might be a little uh, more you know, yeah. <laughs> I'm not well, sure. Yeah, so that so so Garth, how was that working with you know kind of this first these first rounds with Matt where he yeah. was basically telling you how to write the story or how to yeah. change the story? How was that how did how did that change how you had worked previously on your on your novels? when you were really writing for yourself. Oh yeah, when, you know, cause, so I wrote two novels um, and, and, which did okay and even won some book awards and stuff but didn't sell a whole lot of copies. And then I wrote The Art of Racing in the Rain and, and that kind of changed the whole, how you look at things. Just because when you, you know, when a book is sold 6 million copies, it just has different, you know, there's, yeah, it changes your life. I, I'm sorry, it just it changes things. There's no getting around it. It's going to change. Yeah, it's the elephant, right? Yeah. So, uh, but you know, this idea of um, uh, what was the question again? How how was it hearing uh, Matt's suggestions on oh, yeah. on your story? Yeah, because you know what I I, I needed a solution. Um. 
a story has this, <clears throat> stories are about problems, right? Characters have problems. And stories are about the wrong, incorrect, um, un under-informed decisions that characters make. Mm -hmm. If a character made every correct decision, it, there would not be a book. It wouldn't be very captivating. There's no conflict. There's no reason to have, well, I don't want to hear a story about no conflict. Yeah. I want to hear a story about conflict. And so I know how to do that. I know how to construct that story. But honestly, I don't know how to tell it in pictures. Yeah. And, and, and so there's a certain syntax that I had to pick up in the first book of just how do you tell things in pictures? But then there's also like, um, how do you best deliver on, uh, you know, raise the expectations of a reader and then deliver on those expectations. And those are the things that I really depended on Matt to help me nuance. You know, we could go through and, and he could say, well, the way you've written it, this scene is eight pages. And I'd be like, that scene should be a quarter of a page. That was a throwaway scene. That's just treading water. I just wrote that because I didn't know what else to write and I'm bored. So let's cut all those eight pages and make that a quarter of a page. Next. And he'd be like, oh, I didn't realize I could just cut eight pages like that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, this sort of thing. It sounds kind of like, I don't know what I'm doing and he knows everything. It, it not, it's not necessarily like that. I know everything about the story. Yeah. What I needed was someone who could say, I hear what you're saying. I understand what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Let me tell you how to best lay it out so that yeah. readers who don't know you know what you're saying. Yeah. And that's yeah, sometimes, what I that. He was great. Sometimes it's it's almost like Garth's the forest and I'm the trees. And, yeah. uh, you know, which is not always a good, in fact, it's often not a good thing. Uh, because I'm thinking about like, oh, in that panel, that, that elbow looks ridiculous. That doesn't look like an elbow. Garth's not thinking about elbows. You know, Garth's got much, much bigger, broader, more, uh, thematically important things on his mind and I'm I'm like I'm looking at two pages as we as we've been talking I've got two sets of things that are set in the same location and I'm kind of irritated because I'm realizing the waves look different on the like waves of water yeah. look different on one page than they do on the next nobody in the world is going to be looking at this book and going look that guy doesn't know what he's doing he draws waves differently from page to page uh but so having somebody that's not worried about those things, you know, steering the ship or driving the bus or whatever. Right. Uh, and I, and I, to be clear too, uh, not that anyone has asserted otherwise, but I always try to be very, very sensitive to the idea. Like when I would say something to Garth, I would always say, I'm not trying to rewrite the story or I'm not trying to write your thing or this is not a criticism. This is a reaction. You know, uh, because there would be things sometimes where it would be like, like something he was kind of alluding to, where it would be a, a thing of two people, let's say, meeting in a cafe, mm -hmm. and then on a scene, and then another scene of two people, and now they're meeting in a restaurant. It'd be like, well, we had a cafe and a restaurant almost back to back. Could 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 they just be in a car or whatever? You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, let's, so Matt, let's talk about kind of, let's go a little bit into your background too on comics, since that's kind of a, there's a different method of storytelling with comics than there is with the written word. So how do you, so how, as a, as a comic artist, how do you tell the story of a superhero and, and, and how did, how did your, how did your past background with writing kind of superheroes and comics intersect with uh, Tuck in the Cloven? Well, that's an interesting thing. Um, so we were talking earlier about, you know, everybody kind of read comics growing up and I learned yeah. to read from comics and I learned to draw from comics. Uh, the first drawings that my mom has are drawings I did of Batman and Robin. Um, and so kind of baked in baked into what I, I think of stories as is, is just kind of the structure of superhero comics. Now, as I got older and uh, I've always been kind of obsessive about whatever I'm into, 
I, I spread out from superheroes quite a bit. Yeah. Um, and in fact, there was a whole period where I just stopped reading comics altogether and then was sort of brought back by things like uh, Chris Ware's work. Chris Ware did Jim Corrigan, The Smartest mm-hmm. Kid on Earth. I think Chris Ware is a mega genius, uh, which being brought back through something like Chris Ware then eventually kind of got me back reading superheroes again. And then I was drawing superheroes at, at a point. So I'm always aware that I'm a, I'm a musician as well. And yeah. when I was a teenager, I was very interested in being a sort of a guitar hero, someone who could play super fast and could like that, you know, women would fall at my feet because I was such an amazing guitar player. And you know, when, that's kind of a teenage uh, perspective on it. Like, if I show people I'm great, they're going to celebrate me. Right. And, and then you get older, and then it becomes more about, well, what if I just tell the truth? Maybe people will be, you know, be more interested in that. Yeah. So as I've gotten older as, as an artist and as a musician, uh, I've become much more interested in doing that, unless, um, because I found that I was not a virtuoso. I couldn't play in that way and I can't draw on that way. So it became much more about trying to be expressive with my artwork. Mm -hmm. And I became somewhat known uh, for doing this book, Stumptown, which was a crime book. And crime is kind of superhero adjacent. Right. It's It's in the same name. It's on the same block at least. Exactly. Maybe a block over. You yeah the the uh, the good part of town is superhero town. The bad part of town is crime town. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so um, so in that case, a lot of that vocabulary or that um, flavor, that flavoring that I've been steeped in all those years, um, it was about trying to uh, clamp down on that and not use that vocabulary in doing a crime book. Mm-hmm. And so I became very fixated on architecture and mood and silhouette. Mm-hmm. So it was interesting when I started on volume one of The Cloven, a lot of that sort of crime vocabulary was what I was using. Yeah. But what's interesting about The Cloven as a project to me is, and the more I do it, the more this is happening. I'm becoming much, much more expressive much less architectural mm-hmm. and there are elements of the thing that are becoming more super heroic except I don't see them as uh, expressions of, of heroism or even athleticism as much as I see them as kind of expressions of joy yeah and I realize that's that's a little bit abstract but like there's this thing going on in volume two that I'll show you here uh, in fact, I'll show you sort of the process. Okay. Um, at one point, it's there's a there's a sequence when Tuck, our main character, um, gets to join up with other people like him uh, and have kind of a, a reverie. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I had all these ways that I was trying to do it, and I kept working on it, and it was just. They were too dark. Now, obviously, these are visually dark. They're yeah. silhouettes. Yeah. But I, it was, I had the the motion kind of going, and I was like, well, this is sort of superhero-y going on. Mm-hmm. And that wasn't what I wanted. And I and for me to have gotten this far to be inking it means that I had already spent quite a while doing pencil roughs that I had thrown out. And I was like, this is it. I got it. And then I'm halfway through. I'm like, no, I don't have it. Uh, and then I just started again. Like I didn't, uh, unusually for me, I didn't rethink it. I just was like, that's not it, do it again. Mm -hmm. And this is what happened. It became much more joyous. Yeah. Now, isn't isn't that a scene or kind of that kind of ends book one, kind of mm -hmm. that scene, right? There's an echo to that for sure, yeah. 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 Yeah, uh, without... because in this story, just so you know, I mean, so all right, so the, the story of book one has a, a climactic moment of yeah. a big uh, 
party and all in, yeah. the, in the park you know and um this now we're in 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 book two well any good writer will let you know that a, a, the next version the book two always has to be able to stand on its own what yeah. happens if someone didn't read book one so we have to bring them up to speed so matt's using the same syntax that he's established already in book one he's bringing it into book two it's a refresher for those who have read book one and it's an introduction for those who are new yeah. So, right. Cool. Okay. Right. Very much like uh, you know Jim Shooter, who was the uh, the editor in chief at Marvel Comics in the eighties. Here, this is really bringing it back. You're like, tell me about superheroes. Well, I'm going to tell you something about it. <laughs> the editor in chief of Marvel Comics in the eighties. Uh, he he was a very sort of iron fisted editor and, and not very popular with a lot of freelancers. But one thing that he was right about is he would say. Every issue of a Marvel comic is somebody's first issue of that. Yeah. So he wanted it to be very clear in each issue. If it was the X-Men, there would be a page or half a page in which the characters were introduced, even mm -hmm. if you were on the fourth issue of a storyline. Yeah. Um, and so to some degree, that's what we're doing here. Uh, this is very much like Tuck's hero moment before things change right spoiler alert yeah, yeah. yeah. well i'm not going to spoil anything yet <laughs> um so let's let's talk about your collaboration we kind of this kind of dovetails into that so you know when you st you started working in 2016 is that right yeah, or at least the introduction uh, you're yeah. you, you met each other in 2016 and started we started flirting. dating we started dating yeah. in 2016 <laughs> and then you know, stormy we, night yeah, we got pregnant in 2016. Yeah, the baby okay. came out in 20. It became real. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> in January. But. So, so how did your collaboration? You know, you were able to work face to face for the first three years at least. Yeah. How did? So, how have you managed to maintain that collaboration over a long term? And how are you managing to collaborate now? after 15 months of not being able to work face to face. Well, I've got a lot to say about this. Okay. <laughs> Go for it, man. Uh, we, we got time. Um, well, uh, the, the past 15 months for me have been terrible. Um, not just because I haven't been able to see guard, but uh, <laughs> that's going to be part of it. Um, I, I got what I'm convinced was COVID back in February of 2020. Yeah. And I say what I'm convinced of it being COVID is I never went to the doctor, so I never got confirmation, but it's pretty clear that that's what it was. And I got what I eventually learned was long COVID because mm -hmm. I basically felt like I had been kicked in the head for the next nine months or more. And yeah. I'm still still sort of rewiring it seems ridiculous to say that and i spent most of last year just going like are you just lazy or are you old like what happened yeah and and i am also old and lazy but my brain <laughs> it's taken me quite a while to sort of rejigger how i work anyway so that's been a very difficult thing over the past 15 months um but one of the reasons I think that, uh, that things are still working, at least from my perspective, is Garth is, first of all, very patient and very supportive and also seems to be legitimately understanding about it, um, understanding about the process, even, when, even before there was any sort of, you know, pandemic-related nonsense. Yeah. There was... Sometimes it's just not happening. Like he was saying about his father-in-law not wearing the pants, you know. Um, sometimes it's, it just, you can try to make it happen and it just doesn't want to happen yet. Um, so for me anyway, there's been a lot of fits and starts. Uh, I kind of work in binges. And when I really get on a binge, it's like, it's 
I'll just go and go and go and go and go and then boom, I'll hit a wall. Yeah. So, you know, my computer's making a really weird That's noise. okay. I was wondering I, what the noise was coming. I, I, <laughs> I feel like I'm in the matrix or something. Um, yeah, I didn't know you guys could hear that. Well, maybe we can take. This has been challenging. Look, uh, to, to just yeah. jump in. Um, this is. It's been. Uh, this has been a very challenging year. I, I, I can say, for everybody, as we all know, right? Yeah. I think yeah. that um, having you know, because I'm a writer, um, I can speak from my perspective, um, and because I'm a writer, I'm also probably highly egotistical. So I can say that whatever I think probably applies to everyone else. And that is that this um, has been a real challenge for us um, mentally and physically with or without, you know, infection of right. the COVID, right. right? And also that aligns with my sort of, my personal sort of spiritual thrust, which is things are happening um, on a much larger scale than than us like we we tend to like think about ourselves and our relationship with the world and we we're all egocentric in that sense right that we are here we're doing things and what we do changes everybody else right whereas i i, I really take a different perspective which is like I, I things are coming into me and then i'm doing things to reflect that so um I know that Matt's had a lot of personal challenges with illness and uh, obviously if he, you know, the, the COVID, I remember when that was going down and it was like, yeah. is this legitimate or not? And I'm like, well, if you're going through it, it's legitimate. So Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, there's no question. Th don't question your own headspace. That's the problem is that we get into this and we start questioning our own headspace and writers do it and artists do it. And now with COVID, welcome to our world. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> this is what <laughs> right. we go through freaking every day. Like, yeah. Am I crazy or is this good? <sighs> Who knows? And you don't have any coworkers either. You're just, yeah, boring. right. Exactly. There's nobody to bounce yeah. you off of at the water cooler. So, um, you know, uh, while we, I would have, it would have been great to like, you know, be able to pound through this, like a freight train um, on the, you know, what Matt just drew by Carkeek Park, you know, yeah. going hundred miles an hour, um, going where it's going to go without stopping. We have to take that into account, um, both as a sort of creative uh, outlet that, that, you know, and Matt's ability to tap into his, you know, his creative moments, but also like how that contextualizes with the rest of what's going on in our society. So, you know what? We were hoping that, look, honestly, book two was supposed to be out this July. That didn't work. Um, next July, uh, we're hopeful. Yeah. I, I can say that. So by that time, comic cons will be open again and we'll go to the, con see, we, the comic book world is about people. It's touchy feely, the comic book world. It's about holding the floppy. It's about turning the pages. It's not about like zoom, sorry, zoom. Yeah. It's not about that. And so, you know, look, as, as difficult as all this is going, um, ultimately the prize will be met. I know it because if we're destined for it. So yeah. uh, please uh, readers uh, check out book one and we go over some plot issues, uh, plot ideas in that if you'd like to, but yeah. check out book one. If book two is well, we're, we're doing well. We're doing well yeah. on book two and, uh, you know, book three, you know, is going to be transformative and then we'll see where we go from there. Yeah. But so I, I'm very patient. Matt, Matt's the best dude. I mean, Matt's the best artist and he's the guy who's going to tell the story. And if he needs to take some time out in order to do so, take the time out. Good. Yeah. Well, yeah. That, sorry, and that, I just want to say like, that's a rare perspective in the comics world um, to the comics is, as I mentioned earlier, is based on sort of a factory setup. Uh, that's not ne not necessarily true of all graphic novels, but there was very much a like, look, do the job or we'll get somebody who will do the job. And one of the things that's wonderful about working with Garth and with Fantagraphics is that's not how Fantagraphics does business and that's not how Garth does business. And fortunately, uh, 
uh, like it's especially in a year like this one. Yeah, it's giving us some room to sort of to make a better thing. Like yeah. if if I had just pounded through it, it might be done, but it would be I guarantee it'd be terrible. Um, so in my case, like there hasn't been, uh, like breaks exactly. It's been mostly a lot of like, it's been, it's been like doing a crossword puzzle where you, you just can't think of what that word is. Hmm. What is yeah. the word for, hmm. uh, bracket? Braga, what? Braga, those <laughs> eventually you get it. And then you're like, ah, that's what it yeah. was. It's been a lot like that. So, you know, uh, I, I can legitimately say, and, and I can feel self-conscious about almost everything, but I don't feel self-conscious about this. I can legitimately say that the book is going to be better because it's taking this long. Uh, but I'm still frustrated that it's taking. This yeah, 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 it's okay. It's good. It's yeah. good impetus. Well, I, I think readers, I think readers will appreciate your patience and perseverance on getting this, on getting the book two out. And that also answers Ellen. Ellen L wanted to know when the part two of the Cloven was yeah. coming out. Yeah, and I mean, now we know. Hopefully, um, hopefully by next July. Yeah, I and mean, maybe even before that. Who knows? We may be able to drop something. We we may have a little surprise for people. We don't. We don't. We're we're trying to. We're trying to do it, do our work, and and deliver something good, and yeah. and I think we're and we're going to do it. And um, just real quickly though, yeah, for those of people who are here, like, what are these people talking about? Um, the Cloven is a graphic novel, the first book of the Cloven. Here it is, right here. That's the Cloven. Yes, that's book one of it, and it's got all sorts of pages in it, and the on these pages are like beautifully colored uh, pictures and the artwork is lovely and brilliant yeah. and it tells the big story we have even have a big fold out here and when we're doing the fold out i said matt okay we can do a fold out but if we do this in book one what are we going to do to top it in book two and then top that in book three so we yeah. do it had to take all this into account but the idea is that in in the early 90s, there was some experimentation going on in terms of the human genome. As we all know, we've been working on the human genome for decades. And the, in the United States, uh, it is not illegal to alter the human genome. It is in 33 other states, uh, countries in the world, but not in the United States. The United States won't fund that research, but they won't it's not illegal to do it. And that's why what's going on in California right now is the Chimera Project, which is introducing stem cells into um, pig, pig bodies. And so okay. that you, you can grow a, um, an organ inside the pig that will be uh, essentially human and can be implanted into a human without having to have all the drugs that you need to have to suppress the immune system yeah you know. without doing an organ transplant probably. right exactly yeah. and and so this is going to be a great a great thing and they're trying with the spleen first because it's the simplest organ etc cetera, etc cetera. and that and i said what, what happens if this goes to an extreme and so um if it's privately funded uh, it's legal in the united states and of course in the northwest we have plenty of billionaires who have tons of money and a lot of free time and yeah. can do almost anything they want. And so we, we've kind of invented a, a fictional uh, billionaire who has funded a project on Vashon Island. And if you're from the Northwest, you know, if you're from Seattle, you know, if there's anything weird going on, it's going on on Vashon Island. So we have this idea of in the, in the 80s, 90s, this thing going on, and they're trying to uh, uh, solve the riddle of, um, of, of food supply because there are so many people in the world there's not enough food to eat how are we going to feed everybody we need to make more food we need to make more food and this billionaire says maybe not make more food maybe if we just had more food we could eat meaning that if we changed our digestive tract out for the digestive tract of a ruminant who could eat all sorts of vegetation and has multiple stomachs then maybe we don't have an issue 
And so they start messing with the human genome to introduce the goat ruminant uh, okay. genetic genes in there. And they get it, they get it, it works. It works in the digestive tract, but they can't get the hoofs out of the equation. Every one of them is born with hoofs, but yeah. they got it's otherwise that they're perfect. And so they're going to mothball the project. And there's one, uh, Dr. Langner, Dr. Kenneth Langner, kind of the, the, the big the scientist behind this, uh, can't stand to see his creations euthanized. Mm -hmm. So he steals them and releases them by themselves into the mountains of the Cascade Mountains. Yeah. And says, you have to take care of yourselves now. And they do. And they propagate. And some of them stay out there in the mountains, book three. Mm -hmm. And some of them move back into the city where they hide in plain sight, where we don't want to look, which is the homeless encampment that we have in Seattle yeah. called the jungle. Yeah. It's, it's a horrible place with thousands of people living in tents underneath a freeway. It yeah. is not a pleasant uh, living conditions. The, the noise is just it, it, cacophonous. Yeah. Uh, the, the situ it's just a bad situation. And so, but, but people hide there because when the, the cloven can hide there, because when normal people walk by, they avert their eyes. We don't want to see that. We, we don't yeah. see no evil. Right. So we block yeah. that and therefore we don't see the truth of it. And so that's kind of the setup of the story. And in that is, is our hero Tuck, yeah. who's trying to find his origins, his, his creator, his place, so in a real sense, it's a reinterpretation of Mary Shelley's most brilliant work of all time, uh, Frankenstein or yes. the modern Prometheus was her subtitle. Yeah. And so that's where we've, uh, that's where we have with the cloven and book one brings us up to this spot and then we're going to go beyond that and then beyond that. So yeah. Oh, thanks for getting us back on track. Darth. I forgot about <laughs> having the plot uh, <laughs> here. Um, but that sort of lets us dovetail into uh, maybe having you to do it, do uh, show how you illustrate Garth's words with Matt's with Matt's artwork. Yeah. Um, well, let's see if I can do this without my computer self destructing. I don't know what that sound was, but well, it was... it's fine. It seems to be fine now. Yeah. I think it was a soundtrack, Matt. Were you doing a yip yip? I think I've heard that <laughs> in some rap songs. Yeah, it was, I think the way I had the, the thing balanced, I think it was pushing something into the fan. Uh, so I don't have a copy of the script sitting in front of me, but essentially, like mentioned before, it'll be written in something approaching like a screenplay format. It'll say something like, uh, well, like in this case, um, so I showed you, we have this sort of celebratory moment. Yeah followed by a little more celebration, which at the end, there is this tweet sound. Yeah. And what's going on there is the, uh, the cloven have um, kind, of a, kind of a lookout who has a, a whistle that he blows um, and they're, they're having a great time and then they hear the whistle. So on the following pages, it's going to be like all of them going, what's that? What's that? The whistle, you know, yeah. I thought I heard the whistle. So what I will do, I, and especially this sequence in particular is kind of being done in a sort of free form way. Um, in the sense that I'm trying to kind of make moments that are not necessarily linear time-wise. Yeah. You know, the silhouette of a, of a hoof in the air, a hand, kind of a, a joyful hand. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, you know, this is, it's not supposed to be like, you see a hoof, then you see a hand, then you see a face, then you see smiles. It's supposed to sort of be simultaneous. Yeah. Uh, and then, bam, we come to an end there. Now, this will be hard to make out because these are very rough. But essentially along here, will be silhouettes of all the cloven, like, you know, their ears to the sky going, what's yeah. that? Yeah. And we'll be seeing here, this is Tuck's worried face. What's yeah. going to happen is the revelation of why the whistle was blown and 
what that means. And so what I'm trying to do here is go from this simultaneous sense of like joy and you know bacchanalian reverie and blah 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 and then go bam now things are happening in very organized pieces of time yeah like things are being cut into little lengths and you see them look up and then you see the worried look on tuck's face and then you're going to see what is revealed unfortunately i don't want to say what's revealed because it's a little spoilery yeah but uh i didn't plan this but it sort of um illustrates some of what garth was talking about at the beginning uh it, you know garth does did not and no one would write in the script create a sense of simultaneity in the you know in the back in alien moments and then break it down into little chopped up you know temporal slices uh what's going to happen is on the the double page spread that i'm showing you here this is actually two pages kind of okay. split down the middle um we're going to cut it all into this then there's going to be this revelation this disturbing revelation and then there's going to be a bunch of violence on the next four pages and because I have all this freedom working with Garth uh, and this it's not even freedom it's trust yeah uh, because he trusts me um, what I think I'm going to do at least I'm going to try to do this in all the violent scenes I'm going to essentially draw them and then I'm going to start tearing them and then pasting them in torn form so that it's a very oh, violent okay. feeling sequence yeah yeah, uh, I, I want it to feel, you know, and I'm kind of hoping that in places I'll tear it unattractively. Yeah, because, you know, it's we're not doing a rape scene, but if you were doing a rape scene, it should feel awful. It shouldn't yeah. be a beautifully photographed, beautifully drawn experience. It should feel violative. And I don't even know if that's as awful as it is. is. Yeah, right. Uh, and so this is not that but it should feel like the polar opposite of what we had going on here this kind of free form mm -hmm. lovely expression of like ah the wind and my hair and the waves and oh yeah. i feel so beautiful so again uh that's one of the things that's unusual about this project is that because it's ours and we're not doing it for it's not a Spider-Man comic that we have to make appropriate to sell bed sheets and cups at yeah. Burger King. Yeah. Um, and we don't really, we don't have a traditional editor. Um, Eric is our editor, but he, he doesn't mm -hmm. uh, micromanage anything. So we're just able to sort of go freely and, and make things work. And then I'll present these things to Garth and he, he then dialogues them in ways that are similar to what were in the original script, but perhaps have changed over the course of this kind of alchemical thing. And so I can't emphasize enough that in some ways I'm the luckiest cartoonist working on a graphic novel because I'm able to, to suddenly go, yeah, I think I'm gonna tear up all the pages and then glue them back together. And, and then I give them to him and Garth's like, it's great, you're a genius. And I. And then I go take a nap for three or four days. <laughs> I'm going to well, show you. Yeah. I'm going to show you the scene here. I've got it right here. So this is that scene that Matt was just talking about. Okay. He showed you. Um, the shrill whistle is heard. The cloven stop romping. And I was right. And so you see how I write it. it. It almost has nothing to do with what Matt just said and what he drew, but it, it yeah. carries the essence of it. Right. So there's, yeah. I have yeah. stuff in here that is expositional because we need to know what's going on. Yeah. But that's really almost a whisper to Matt to say, this is what's going on. And then he draws it. I can pretty much cut like that that this expositional tuck voiceover from the gatekeeper kept the dog whistle yeah if we do it right we can we can cut that dialogue we can cut that voiceover yeah 
right? So yeah. really a lot of what I do in the script is right for Matt. Mm -hmm. I see, yeah. For him to interpret into images that people will get without having yeah. to write dialogue. And it's, it's important to note too, um, because I don't want it to sound, uh, I, don't, I don't want it to sound incorrect, that there are times that I've done that, that we're then like, no, we need to include whatever the voiceover. Yeah, we need absolutely. to include the thing yeah. that- there, There's I, the thing where there, there, there was a moment in the first, for, where, where I said, we, we missed, you missed the beat. We missed the beat on this because there mm -hmm. needs to be this because it's gonna come up later. And so, right. so that's, you know, that's, but that's, dude, that's like, that's all I have to do. Yeah. <laughs> Just keep you on script, Matt. That's all I have yeah. to do. Yeah. yeah. Great. That's yeah. Easy. And it's, it's funny too, because uh, Garth obviously knows this, but I have a degree in playwriting and of course playwrights, like you don't change anything. Yeah. You don't, you, you change nothing. And I actually had a production where my cast and my director through a series of misunderstandings actually changed a bunch of stuff. And I had to actually kind of, I didn't exactly fire anybody, but I had to sort of come in and say, no, we're going back to the script as written. So I'm very conscious of like, what's, what's happening, you know? Yeah. Uh, so I don't, I don't do it. Um, hopefully I don't do it lazily and hopefully I don't do it uh, out of a lack of discipline. Hopefully it's, it's for the right reason, but yeah. I'm aware that like, it's a sort of, you know, it's a special circumstance. Yeah, I mean, it's, it seems like you two have a, almost interpret, can interpret each other, almost mind, almost read each other's minds a little bit. Well, we talk, well, like when we talk, uh, yeah. as I mentioned, it's very discursive. We talk around the thing, which again, you don't really do in a lot of these sort of collaborations. Yeah. But it's what art does. I mean, when you go to, you know, the Seattle Art Museum or the Everett Art Museum or... Um, you know, uh, whatever museum yeah. you want to go to, you stand in front of a painting and, and you have a conversation with the artist. Yeah. And that, that's all it is. It's an exchange. It's like, I think this, what do you think? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so in a, in a weird way, um, it's like, I think this, and I give it to Matt and he's like, well, I, I see what you're thinking. And in order to make it work, visually i think we need to do this and i say yeah yeah so you know i mean it's like it, it actually is a no-brainer for me personally and hopefully for matt too you know this idea of it's not it's not necessarily uh reading minds it's it's being able to read symbols uh and interpret them in a in a way that is yeah what's that word there's a word uh, i don't know um, <laughs> Matt, you got to have it. Symbiotic. Well, symbiotic. Uh, there you go. Okay. He's a new member of the club. <laughs> Kurt, Article Three. Woohoo! I was gonna say it's a lot like being in a band. It's yeah. Uh, Garth, yeah. Garth writes a song. It's about something in his life, and he brings it in. And in this case, we're both in the band together. And I'm like, I start playing something, and then maybe it's not what he thought, yeah. but he responds to that and then all of a sudden by the end of it we have an album yeah and and it's our album it's not yeah. that but it's like but it's like before the white album right because that's <laughs> when they started fighting <laughs> yeah yeah let's not do all the, the white yeah. album and <laughs> all the creativity let's not do let it be all the creativity and none of the arguing <laughs> right. right yeah yeah um, we haven't really argued yet well no 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 see there was one moment okay there was one moment in book uh, in book one. Oh my God, I should probably pull it up just for fun, but I won't. Um, there was a moment where it's like, there was one thing and, and oh, we had yeah. gotten, we were refining and we're working with Eric Reynolds, our, our editor. He's like in deep on this now, cause we're going to, we're going to print. Right. Yeah. And so we're going to lock it yeah. and it's locked. Once it's locked, once it, once it goes off to print, forget about it's it. It's done. Yeah. So, and I'm like, Matt, that that's there's a there was a bubble in the wrong place. There was a se sequence oh, of a scene. Yeah, it was yeah. the end of a chapter, and mm -hmm. it was really important. And I'm like, this is going to work, but that bubble needs to move from there to there because of the way we read, 
right? Because we yeah. read left to right, top to bottom. Yeah. That's in the West. That's what we're trained. Yeah. And so we, we have to be cognizant of that. And I wanted to hold that last, I wanted to hold it. There was a comment that was made by a character and I wanted it to be the last thing that we walk away with when we turn the page. And Matt wouldn't change it. He didn't change it. He wouldn't change it. He didn't change it. I kept on saying, Matt, that, it's not working. It's not working. It's not working. You got to change that. Got to move that. Got to move that. And he wouldn't do it. I'm like, Eric, I call up Eric. I'm like, Eric, can you intervene here? Tell Matt to move the freaking box. So Eric is like, Matt, move the box, move the bubble, move the bubble, move the bubble. He was well, not moving the bubble. I'm like, what's going on? Move the bubble. And there's silence. And then he sends a new page and he puts the bubble in a whole different place that I never thought he would. And Eric never thought he would. And I'm like, damn it, Matt, that's the right place for the bubble. How did you know that? Why didn't you give me that early? It wasn't where I thought it should be, but it was the perfect place. And I'm like, that's, that's it then. Okay. Now we're, now the book is done. Send it off. To print. Yeah. Yeah. That's the forest and the trees thing. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, in this case, it was an acorn. It wasn't even a tree. It was an acorn. <laughs> well, have you guys thought about anything? We know, we know you've got the second and third books of the Cloven coming out. Has, have you guys thought about any ways of developing that for TV or movie? Or are you working on any other collaborations? Not either a fourth part for the Cloven or something completely new? Well, I as far as you know, parts three and four and everything, certainly we've talked about them and this past year being so weird, it's yeah. just sort of slowed things down. I'm still totally on board with it. Like that's actually one of the interesting things is I keep kind of going like, you know, why is this taking so long? And then I'll sort of double check and I'm like, no, I haven't lost interest. It's not about that, um, which, would not be unusual. There are plenty yeah. of projects I've worked on where I just can't sustain the interest. Uh, that's not the case here. Um, so I know that, you know, certainly book two will be done sometime in the sort of near future. Uh, and book three, like we've talked quite a bit about that already. We've mm -hmm. talked a bit about a book four as a sort of, what if there was a book four? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, as far as I'm concerned, like, yeah, let's keep going. Let's, let's go as long as we can. It's just that uh, this, this year has been so strange for one particular reason uh, outside of what we've been talking about. As Garth mentioned, comics is a very, uh, it's kind of a personal business. Like you're, you're selling at cons, you're meeting people at conventions. Mm -hmm at which you always get sick, by the way. Right. Even when there's not a disease that's killed over half a million people. Yeah. So that not being around has weirdly changed the sense of the calendar. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think everybody sort of expressed the feeling that this has been like the longest year of our lives. And also yeah. it felt like it happened very fast at the same time, like some weird elasticity of time. So in some ways, talking about a fourth volume is terrifying. And in some ways, it's very reassuring. Uh, look, I mean, we're going to do, we're going to be true to the story and to the audience. And if they want another book, we'll, we'll, give, we'll, we'll figure out how to do it. And um, I, I would say, you know, we, we have, you know, we have our, our Hollywood agent uh, busy at work. Um, Hollywood had some issues. Um, and so we're, you know, looking to get into the refire of that. Obviously, I think it would be a wonderful, you know, series on on one of the streaming channels. Mm -hmm. um, I think we could really have fun with it and take it to far and and interesting places. For instance, I said to I said to, to Matt, if we're if we are talking about a book four, Matt, just so you know, if we're talking about book four. We may have to go to Paris to do some research because the first scene of book four starts at a cafe at the foot of the Eiffel Tower because the Cloven were actually 
not in the context of the in the context of the book the cloven were actually invented in france before they were in the united states and in it's france good. they called them chevre so yeah um and that's where parkour began as well and and if we, as we know the cloven yeah. are big parkour fans they are so pretty. we we yeah, are going to have to go to paris yeah yeah, and a little French countryside. Maybe we'll get into some cheese making and some wine making. But the the point is, it, it's portable and can go anywhere. But you know what the whims and and uh, uh, vicissitudes of um, you know where media goes. What's kind of refreshing about doing a graphic novel is just freaking do it, man. I mean, yeah. whatever. Yeah, is it going to become a huge like there there there? Uh, what what's the problem with well, with the arts, with writing in particular, is we, we want the like we don't want to write a book. Nobody wants to write a novel. Everyone wants a Pulitzer Prize. Yeah, that's why we're writing. That. I mean, that's <laughs> the problem. That most people are thinking, I want the product. I want and the award. I'll, I'll yeah. do some steps to make the product happen. Mm -hmm. And and that can't be. That's not. That's wrong. That's wrong. Mm -hmm. Anybody who thinks that. Don't think that you have to find the joy and the love and the satisfaction in the process. Yeah. You know? Yeah. If the process sucks and you end up with a product that people seem to like, all right, you want to replicate that? I don't think so. But, you know, if the process is true and the process is right, and if you happen to be aligned, energetically with sort of with the zeitgeist with what people are looking for what what people are questioning what people are concerned about or what what people hope and what they fear right yeah. and if you can align with that um well look then you have a hit um but we can't write to a hit i'm pretty convinced of that having written both complete flops and total hits yeah. i will tell you if you set out to write a hit, you're going to fail. You need to set out to write the truth and the joy and the love that exists within you, put it out there, and then hopefully uh, people will, will sync up with that in the process. Yeah. Hey, I've got, we got a question here from Cheryl. Can you talk about whether you want the drawings to drive the reader's experience or should the text drive the reader's experience? Noted some people pay more attention to the text, some to the drawings. Hmm. I, to me, that's, uh, it's a, that's a question that's slightly um, trying to, this sounds rude. I'm sorry, Cheryl. I don't mean to sound rude when I say this. That's like saying, do you want the melody or the chords to drive the song? Okay. Uh, the, the chords inform the melody and vice versa. And of yeah. course the lyrics are informed by the melody too. Imagine somewhere over the rainbow, if it was a ragtime piece, you know, it would feel differently. Um, yeah. So when we're making a product, a product, when we're making a project, um, what I'm hoping is that the two are, are seamless, that it yeah. should feel like they, they drive each other. You can't differ. In fact, I, I say, uh, that's a great question, Cheryl. Thank you for asking. And that uh, the, if you're talking about the text as in like the words the characters are saying, then don't even, because uh, that's subtext. I mean, that's text that is being driven by subtext. So the question is, do we want the images or the subtext? Well, the images are what carries the subtext. So yeah. it is all aligned. The dialogue that characters say to each other are the things that they're thinking on the very top part of their head when they're having the dialogue because that's what they're concerned about. But deep down, their concerns are much different. And that's what you need the pictures to convey. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, kind of, you can't really have one without the other. Yeah. yeah. And so in, in that sense, um, Look, the, the, this project, this book, this story would be nothing without the images. I tried it. It was nothing. Yeah, you're Trust right. You're right just take my word for it. Just, <laughs> just take my word for it. And I'll publish a, at some point. I'm going to put the original short story up on my website, which everyone should check out. All you people who have stuck around, um, check out um, the, thecloven project.com. 
And uh, that's our, our website devoted to, the, to this um, project, to our graphic novel. Uh, and it has stories on it that are both uh, fictional and non-fictional and hopefully may confuse you a little bit as to where what's really happening and what isn't in terms of you know, genetic um, um, explorations that scientists are doing right now. Yeah. Uh, but also, you know, I, I put up some some stuff like a, a brief short story I wrote as a kind of a companion piece. And and uh, at some point, I'm going to drop the original short story on there. So yeah. you can see, you'll see where it started, you know, uh, and, and how we're trying to, you know, st stick with that and yet expand upon it in yeah. a dynamic way. And you've got a lot of good character backstory hidden in there too. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, for sure. The Easter eggs for everybody. Yeah, yeah. And we, there can, I mean, this, what's so great is that there's, there's so many characters right now in the story yeah. that can just go off. We could write a whole, a whole volume just on uh, Kenneth Langner, the brilliant geneticist who invented the cloven. Yeah. Um, and, and we may. Yeah. So uh, we're all for it. You know, it's just as, as you know, we got to get Matt's hand to draw those things. So, yeah, I want to know on you, story brother. Of what's going on with uh, Goff's daughter when she's off stage? She's got a whole life that we haven't explored at all. Oh, yeah, in volume three. Yeah, yeah, Goff's okay. daughter. Barry Barry Goff is the character in the book who's the billionaire, the yeah. quirky billionaire, and he has a daughter, um, Stella, who's who's pretty dynamic and. Uh, uh, we don't know where she stands, yeah. frankly. We don't know if she's on, we think she's on Tuck's side, but maybe she's on her father's side. We, we're we not quite sure. Um, and but we're going to uh, get there. We'll get there. We will get there for okay. sure. Hey, I've got one more comment here from Fanny Noel. Uh, listening to you guys talk about this book, I can almost hear the music that will someday hopefully be attached to it. Yeah. Yeah, here he is. Here yeah, he okay. Is. <laughs> Take it away, Matt. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, we've talked a little Matt's bit. Matt's out there with everybody. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey. Who says I'm not a writer? Um, we've talked about that. And, you know, should I ever get far enough ahead of the, the curve, which again, could theoretically happen. Like I said, I work in binges. I'm, yeah. I'm waiting for the big binge. And it hasn't hit me yet, but uh, it would be fun to make a little score yeah. to the project. Yeah. All right, we got one last question here. Uh, this is for you, Garth. Uh, are you working on any other novels now? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I, I, uh, I had a difficult creative year as well um, last year. Yeah. Partially because I believe that it's about attention span. I think that we, uh, last year really messed with my ability to concentrate um, over long periods of time. And, and long periods of time means two hours. Yeah, I am. Like, well, literally, that's how, right? That's how reductive we got last year. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and if you can't concentrate for two hours without checking, you know, your news feed and your Twitter and your tweets and all that kind of crap, then, then, you can't write a, you cannot write a novel. You can't, you just cannot do it. I'm going to tell you right now, you can't do it. So sometimes when you can't do something, the best thing to do is not do anything because otherwise you're just beating your head against your own um, failings. And yeah. it's easy. Yeah. We artists, we writers can beat her. We, we do that really good. We, I don't need practice to do that. So um, I am working on I'm working on two projects right now as as traditional novels. Um, yeah. I, I have my old lady book I call it. Um, it's called A Couple of Old Birds, um, about two um, 87 year old women who become new best friends at a late point in their life. Uh, it didn't work on my first iteration, and then I set it aside, and now I've been taking it up again, and I, I'm gonna I think it's gonna work. Uh, so I'm, work, I'm still, you know, putting the polishing touches on that. And um, I'm also working on a novel, oddly enough, as a collaboration, not with Matt, but with another writer, a nonfiction writer named Neil Bascombe, uh, who's a well accomplished. Uh, his last book was called Faster and, and his big book was called um, uh, Winter, The Winter Fortress. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, so he's, he's good at historical fiction. And we're working on a book, a novel together um, that really centers around the uh, Native American um, boarding schools um, oh, wow. of the late 1800s. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, 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 you know, before anyone's like, well, why are you writing about Native American boarding schools? Um, just so you know, I am a, a card carrying Clinkett Indian from Southeastern Alaska. My mother's family is from there. And uh, while culturally I am not a clinket because it was eradicated to a large degree uh, for my mother's generation, um, I understand this idea of assimilation, you know, which, which takes over um, um, sort of the Native American trajectory um, starting in the late 1800s, but in Alaska later than that. Yeah, uh, and and so really kind of trying to d- delve into what it felt like to be, you know, um, a Native American child who's taken away from his or her family, um, restricted, can't speak your own language, can't have any customs, can't have any contact with your family, and you're going to be here in this school for ten years, yeah, and we will we will mind control you. Yeah. So we're, we're working on that and it's, it seems to be going pretty well. So I hope I'm hopeful to have a couple of projects uh, coming out soon. Yeah. Good. Well, I think this is a good time to wrap it up. It's been a pleasure having both of you here and uh, talking about the Cloven and the Cloven book two and book three and maybe book four <laughs> and maybe book five <laughs> and the soundtrack and the soundtrack. Um, so audience, thank you again for joining us. Um, we have upcoming uh, open book events this summer that include uh, Lupe Wong, the author of Lupe Wong Won't Dance, uh, the winner of both the Pacific Northwest Booksellers Award and Sid Fleischman Humor Award. That's Donna Barba Higuera. She'll join us at 10 a.m. Friday, June 18th. Um, after that, we have Casey McQuiston, author of the New York Times bestselling debut novel, Red, White, and Royal Blue, which won the 2020 Alex Award. Um, she will join us at 3 p.m. Uh, Thursday, July 18th. All of these events and more can be found at snowisle.org forward slash open book. And audience, and Garth and Matt, thank you again. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.